those that led us in worship, the orchestra, I can only imagine how hard it is to play this early in the morning. But thank you guys. Thank you so much for leading us today. We want to welcome those that are joining us from our Mount Vernon campus or Olive Drive campus or however you might be with us in this worship service. We're glad you're here. I, I want us to open our Bibles together to the Old Testament book of Haggai. If you can find the Gospel of Matthew and turn back a few pages, you'll be there. We're in a series of messages called Ancient Words for Modern Times. It's a study of each of the last 12 books of our Old Testament called the Minor Prophets. We're looking today at Haggai in a message called Consider Your Ways. Now let me begin the message by reading one verse out of the first chapter, verse number six, where Haggai says, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat and do not have enough. You drink, but are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. I started to title the message, my pocket's got a hole in it. But then I thought, well, it sounds too much like a bad country western song. So, uh, you know, I remember when I was a little boy that occasionally I would get a hole in the pocket of my jeans. And I could never quite figure out how that happened. Now, I understood how I got a hole in the knees of my jeans, but I couldn't figure out how I kept getting a hole in the pockets of my jeans. And I hated that because you, you put a nickel or a quarter in my pocket, I'd feel it eventually slide down my leg into my cowboy boots. And so if I got ready to buy a sucker or a piece of candy, I had to always pull off my boot. It's frustrating to have a hole in a pocket because a pocket is supposed to hold things. Now, when you get to be an adult, you find out sometimes that your billfold has a hole in it. In fact, it's sometimes like a black hole. You put money in it and it just disappears. If you get paid by the month, you always seem to run out of money before you run out of month. Well, Haggai says you earn wages and you put it into a bag that has a hole in it. Now, the context is obviously economic, but I think it has a much greater connotation. He's speaking about the priorities of life. He's speaking really about life itself and how we fill our lives with various things and then we don't get the meaning out of life that we anticipated that we might have. We think that if we put into our life a certain relationship or a certain job or a new house or a new car or a promotion, that somehow we're going to have a greater meaning to our life, that we're going to be happy. And yet our happiness has a way of leaking out because the bag has a hole in it. And the message of Haggai is that God himself has put that hole into our life. He, he's put a hole in the bag that contains our fulfillment and our happiness, and he allows it to leak out. And we're going to see the reason for that uh, on occasion. It's amazing when you look at the context of Haggai, if you really look at it carefully from beginning to end, which is a very short book, you'll discover that Haggai was only a prophet for roughly four months. Now, the average stay of a pastor in a church in America is about four years. But imagine if they only stayed for four months. That was the ministry that is recorded for us by Haggai. Haggai was a prophet during the reign of Darius, who was the king of Persia we're told in verse 1. Uh, his book consists really of four distinct sermons. The first sermon is a rebuke concerning the temple. The second message is a word of encouragement. And the third message is a word of promise. He predicts the coming of the Messiah. And the fourth message is really a word of prophecy that someday God's going to overthrow the Gentile or the pagan kingdoms of the world and restore the Davidic kingdom. The Messiah is going to sit and rule upon a throne. It's a prophecy concerning the millennium yet to come in the future. We don't have time to look at all four messages, so I want to zero in on the first because the message that he gives concerning the temple, I believe, is the primary focus of the book. Haggai lived and wrote during the time of the Old Testament that we call the Restoration Period. Now, we looked at the prophet Zephaniah 
and before him Habakkuk, they were both contemporaries along with the prophet Jeremiah. All three of them preached and prophesied that God was going to allow Judah to be destroyed because of their sin. And it was going to be destroyed in a very unique way. It wasn't going to be fire and brimstone. He was going to allow the Babylonians to come in and conquer them. They did not listen. And the Babylonians who had defeated the Assyrians earlier and had now become the only world superpower, they did destroy the city of Jerusalem. And they led the young people away into captivity or slavery. Now later, the Persians defeated the Babylonians. And so the slaves of Judah that had belonged to the Babylonians now belonged to the Persians. And the Persian king Cyrus decided to allow the people of Judah to go back home. And so Haggai was a prophet when they returned. In fact, the last three prophets of our Old Testament, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, are all called post-exilic prophets. That is, they lived and they prophesied after the return from the Babylonian captivity. When the Jewish people were told by Cyrus that they could return to Judah, only a handful did so, less than 50,000. Because by then, they had roots in Babylon. They had mixed their religion and their cultures, and they, for the most part, were far away from God. So a relatively small handful returned with a man by the name of Zerubbabel. Now Cyrus, the Persian king, had returned also their gold. Uh, the Babylonians had pilfered all their gold out of the temple and so forth, and, and now Cyrus had that gold, and he returned it to the people and said, you can rebuild the temple. So when Zerubbabel came back into the city, they cleared off all the rubble from 70, 80 years of rubble there, and they laid the foundation of the temple. It took two full years to do that. And when they finished the foundation of the temple, in essence, they had a party. They danced around the altar, and they worshiped God, and they offered a sacrifice, and then everything stopped. Eighteen years goes by, and no one did anything about the rebuilding of the temple. The, the temple had a foundation, but nothing else. And so, bursting onto the scene was a prophet by the name of Haggai. And Haggai asked, why aren't you doing something? You started the temple, why don't you finish it? And then Haggai declared to him, I know what's wrong. You stopped building the temple of God because you started building your own homes instead. And they had. They were building these beautiful palatial homes with cedar paneling, and they had an attitude, we, we don't really have time for the temple. We don't have time for God anymore. And Haggai said, if you leave the building of the temple and you simply build your own houses instead, understand this, God is not going to bless us. We're going to sow, but we're not going to reap very much. We're going to eat, but we're still going to be hungry. We're going to drink. He says, but we'll still be thirsty. We're going to be clothed, but we're not going to be warm. We're going to earn wages to put it in a bag with a hole in it because God will see to it. Now, remember, the temple was not just their place of worship. The temple was an emblem in many ways of their national identity. It represented not only their religion, but their identity as a nation. And when they refused to rebuild the temple, they were saying, in essence, we don't really need God. We don't want God in our lives. We want to restore our farmland. We want to build our houses. And, and so Haggai asked, why aren't you building the temple? And they gave him a number of excuses. And they weren't really very good ones. Someone has said, an excuse is the skin of the truth stretched over a lie. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's some truth in that, don't you think? Uh, they told a little bit of truth, but they stretched it over a lie. Here, here's the first principle. Sometimes we use procrastination as an excuse for our spiritual disobedience to God. Look in chapter 1, verse number 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to be in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your way. 
the people were saying, well, the time is just not right. We've got to build our houses first, and then we'll build the temple. Well, 18 years has went by. And they're saying, well, it's just not the right time. You know, procrastination kind of spoils obedience, doesn't it? You tell your child when they're growing up to do something, and they say, just a minute. Now, what that really means is this. They're saying, Mom, Dad, I'm going to disobey you, but I'm not going to come right out and say it. And that's what the people were doing with God. God said, I want you to build the temple, and they were saying, just a minute. Uh, which they were saying, we're not really going to obey you, but we're not going to come right out and say that. We're going to get around to it, just not now. Do you know the greatest spiritual excuse uh, that people use is not now? The Bible teaches that Satan blinds the eyes of those that are not saved. How does he do that? People who aren't saved aren't saved because they're atheists. I mean, most people in our culture, according to surveys, say they believe in the existence of God. Most people who are not Christians say that they want to be a Christian someday. Someday they say, I want my life to be changed. Someday I want to live by the values of Christ, but not now. You talk to young people. And they'll say, well, I don't want to be saved now. You know, they're kind of enjoying life, and they want to maybe sow a few wild oats. And when I'm a young adult, you know, then have a family, then I'll get saved. And then you talk to them about that, and they go, well, I don't have time for church. We've got little children. It's a lot of trouble to put a child in a nursery on time change Sunday, I can tell you. And, hey, we're working two jobs. We, we don't have time. When the children get a little older, then we'll come to church. Then we'll give our life to Christ. And then the children get a little older, and they say, oh, we're torn in different directions. We have all these social activities and sports on Sunday mornings, and, and, and we're tired on the weekend anyway. We don't have time for church or for God. When we retire, then we'll give our life to Jesus. And then when people retire, they say, hey, We've been busy our entire life. We have time to travel now. We don't have time for God. I once witnessed to a man who was in a rest home. He was bedfast, an invalid. And I pressed the claims of Christ upon this man. And he said, you know what, preacher? I know I need to be saved. Next spring, when it warms up and I'm feeling better, I'll get saved. I mean, that's literally what he said. He said, it's cold now, and I don't feel good right now, but when I'm feeling better next spring, I'll give my life to Jesus. Now, isn't that absurd? I mean, when are you going to do it? You say, I want to become a Christian. You're coming to church, or you're listening. When is my question. That was the question of Haggai. When? The message of Haggai is now is the time to make God a priority within our life. I find that even believers sometimes put things off. They say, well, I'm a, I'm a Christian, but I'm not very faithful to church, you know. But someday I will be. Someday I'm going to start giving to the Lord's work. Someday I'm going to start reading my Bible every day. Someday I'm going to join a life group. Someday I'm going to get involved in ministry. When? When? When are you going to be the person that God wants you to be? When are you going to make all those commitments? Now, the Bible is not written chronologically. The history book that applies to this time period is really the book of Ezra, and then just a little bit later, the book of Nehemiah. So look with me in Ezra chapter 4. It's the same time period of Haggai. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. The people of the land were the people that had not went into the captivity. And they troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Here's the principle. At times we allow opposition or criticism from others to become excuse for our spiritual disobedience to God. When the Jews came back in to build, uh, rebuild the temple, the group of people to the north said, we'll help you. And the Jews said, no, you, you can't help us because you're not really true Jews. The people to the north of Judah had one time been called Israel, 10 tribes in the north. 
They were destroyed more than a century before by the Assyrians. And the Syrians scattered them and intermarried with them. And so uh, they, they were not really of Jewish ancestry. And, and by the New Testament time, they were called Samaritans. And so these Samaritans were offended that the Jews would not let, let them help. So they wrote a letter to Artaxerxes, the Persian king, and accused the people of rebelling concerning taxation. So Artaxerxes passed an, ed, uh, an edict and had them stop construction of the temple. So they stopped, really, in many ways, because of opposition. If you're going to stop obeying God because of opposition or criticism, then it won't be long before you stop. Because there's nothing of eternal significance that's ever done without opposition and even criticism. Opposition to faith in our culture is rapidly increasing, is it not? Look with me in verse 8 of chapter 1 of Haggai. He says, go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Now, here's the principle. At times, our reasons for not serving God are simply excuses to cover our spiritual laziness. Now we're getting down to the real reason. They're not building the temple, I think, because it was just hard work. When they were in Babylon, they had this dream. They had dreamed for 70 years. The people had that they're going to come back into the land, and they're going to rebuild the temple of Solomon, and they're going to worship God. But now they're looking up on the mountain, and there's big trees up there that has to be cut down with axes. And then they've got to drag them all the way to the temple. And they're thinking, that's just too much work. There's things in the Christian life that are essentially work. That's why we're called uh, disciples. It comes from the root word discipline. It takes discipline for us to grow in our spiritual life. It takes discipline to, to work, to minister to other people, to kind of dirty our hands in the mess of other people's life. It takes time. It takes a, an effort. But today in churches, not ours, I hope, but in many churches, We've made the highest mark of spirituality simply knowledge. That if you know your Bible, then you are automatically spiritual. If you know the divisions of the Bible, if you know all the stories of the Bible, you must be a spiritual giant. But that's not what spirituality is about. Spiritual activity and spiritual maturity are not the same thing. Spiritual maturity has to do with living out our faith, living out what we've learned in the Word of God. We're not fed spiritually when we come to church in the Word of God just so we get spiritually obese. We take in spiritual nutriment, nutrients from the Word of God so that we might learn to live more like Jesus. And it takes discipline to learn the Word of God. It's like a seminary student who was complaining to his professor about a book that had been assigned. He said, this book is so dry. And the professor said, why don't you dampen it a little with the sweat of your brow? <laughs> it takes work to learn the Word of God, discipline to read the Bible, to come to church, to get your kids around and be here. It takes effort. It takes an effort to serve the Lord. People say, oh, I want to be like Jesus. The problem is we don't want to live with discipline. The people wanted a great temple, but they didn't want to go chop down those big trees and drag them by hand to the temple. So they laid the foundation. They said, that's enough. That's good enough. In Greek mythology, there was a man named Narcissus who looked into a mirror and fell in love with his own reflection. That's our culture. It's fallen in love with its own reflection. Think of the catchwords of our, of our culture, self-improvement, self-worth, self-esteem. It all relates to me. And we carry that over into our spiritual life and we say, edify me, build me up, only sing the songs I want. We're living in a society that's reaping the results of being narcissistic, selfish to the core. That, that's why abortion is so rapid. It's a matter of selfishness. People say, well, it's my right. Women say, it's my body. It's an act of selfishness to take another human being's life. That's why the divorce rate is so high. People say, well, what about me? What about my rights? What about my happiness? What about my fulfillment? The people of Haggai's day were saying, it's not the right time. 
but really it was a matter of selfishness and laziness on their part. But here's the next principle. Sometimes God does not bless us because of misplaced priorities. Look with me in verse number 9 of chapter 1. You look for much, but indeed it, indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because my house that is in ruins, my house is in ruins while every one of you runs to his own house. They had this great vision, we're going to build the temple. But when they came back to the land, they found their own houses had been burned. Their city was in ruins. The land was basically sterile from lack of cultivation. Their neighbors were hostile. Food was scarce. The economy was shattered. There was no place to live. And their attitude was, who needs this? So they started building their own houses. Now, there's nothing wrong with building your own house. I mean, that's fine. The book of Haggai is about priorities. Haggai is saying, you took care of what was yours in selfish ambition, and you left the house of God in ruins. In other words, you did not put God first. And God says, I'm going to put a hole in your life. Your happiness is going to leak out. You're going to keep trying to fill it with things, but it's like a bag with a hole in it. It's a picture of many people's life today. Verse 9 says, you look for much, but it came to little. Why? Because I blew on it. God says, Whew. they had plenty of time to build their own houses, but they had no energy and no interest really for the things of God. And so Haggai says this in verse number five. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, consider your ways. Verse number seven, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. What God is saying is I want you to reevaluate what you're investing in. Your life now has diminishing returns. Your life has become like a giant bag that you stuff things in. People stuff a promotion in and stuff, and they think that's going to bring happiness, but it, it doesn't. And then they think, oh, if I could just have more money, if I could have a bigger house, a newer car, if I could just have this relationship, if I could just get out of that relationship. And they have all kinds of things they stuff into our lives, and they don't realize that God has taken scissors to the end of the bag, and it has a hole in it. And people say, why can't I be happy? People are looking for fulfillment. That, that's why there's so much sexual promiscuity and even perversion. That's why drug addiction is epidemic. People are looking for something to fulfill their life. They're trying to put things into this bag of life to give meaning, and they don't realize that God has punched a hole in it. But God says, if you make me a priority, then it'll be different. If you don't make me a priority, then your bag is going to leak out. It's kind of a spiritual inflation, right? Those of us who lived through the 1970s, we know about inflation. There's a whole new generation being introduced to the ravages of economic inflation as the cost of everything rises quicker than wages. Spiritually, that's a picture of our society. People putting things into the bag thinking that it's going to add value, but it's a bag with a hole in it. Napoleon was a man like that. He was a brilliant man. He was a, a, a brilliant strategist in many ways. He thought he was going to conquer the world, but in the end, he spent the last years of his life marooned on a little rock island. Instead of a kingdom to rule over, he had a couple of gardens that he took care of. Instead of legions of soldiers, he had a half dozen men or so, a doctor, a jailer, and a few others. His life had become a bag with a hole in it. He'd put so much in his life thinking it would give meaning, but in the end, it was nothing. And there are people doing that today. A man can amass a, 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 a fortune and spend all of his life after money, and then he dies and finds out it was a bag with a hole in it because he can't take it with him. Jesus said, what is a profit? A man, if he gains the whole world, and yet he loses his soul. I've often noticed people who grew up in hard times, maybe even during the Depression. They spend their life building an estate for their children, their grandchildren. They want their children to have something better than what they had. So, so they'll go without a vacation. They'll drive an old clunker car. They'll go through the house early in the evening, turning off the lights to save electricity. They live very austere lives. And then I've seen it happen over and over and over again. The children 
that they were trying to build an estate for did not have the same values they had. Their life had become a bag with a hole in it. They were able to impart financial wealth, but their children didn't even appreciate it because their children had rejected their values. It's like pouring it into a bag that has a hole in it. Only eternal things pay eternal dividends. Jesus said, why don't you store your treasure in heaven where moth and rust don't enter in? He's using money as an illustration of something that is of greater value, our priorities. Now, I suppose the message of Haggai is a message of stewardship in many ways. It's about placing God first in the money of our life. And if we don't, then God blows on what's left. It's, it's if you give a tithe to the Lord's work, one-tenth, God makes the 90% go further. If you don't tithe, your life becomes like a bag with a hole in it. You wonder where it all went. But that's not the central message of Haggai. The message... In many ways, there's a principle that Jesus stated in the New Testament, in the Sermon on the Mount, where he's talking about uh, food and clothing and, and, and physical possessions. And then he says this in Matthew 6, For after all these things the Gentiles, the pagans seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Isn't that what Haggai is saying? Make God the prior of your life. Go ahead and build his temple. Don't worry about your houses. God is going to take care of you. In Greek mythology, there was a king by the name of Horus. Horus wanted to build a treasure house, a vault, to hold his wealth. So he hired two brothers that were architects, Trophimus and uh, Arcadius. And they built a vault that was supposed to be the most secure in all of the empire. Uh, but they left one stone out in the back of the vault. There they left it loose. And they were the only ones who knew where the loose stone was. The king put all of his treasure in this vault and it kept being depleted. And he couldn't figure it out. He had even had some of the guards and soldiers that guarded it executed. He didn't know the very ones who had designed the treasure house did it with a hole in it so they might rob him. That's the way people are building their lives today in our culture. They think, oh, if I just had this, if I had that, if I could go on this vacation, if I could do that, if I had this relationship, then I would be happy. My life would be perfect. But they're building their life with a bag with a hole in it because they left God out. Here's the last principle. All of our excuses for not serving God come down to a lack of faith. That's really what the book of Haggai is about, misplaced trust. The root of the problem was a lack of faith. They, they, they were thinking, we, we don't really need God. We, we don't need the temple. We, we need to, what we need to do is take care of our farmland. We need to build our businesses. We need to build our houses. They were, in essence, saying, we're, we're okay. We're moral enough. We're good enough. And people today think, they, they think, well, when I die and I stand before God, I'll kind of talk my way out of it. I'll have some excuses. There's no excuse for the lack of faith. None. In chapter 1, verse 9 that we read earlier, in many ways is the crux of his message. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of my house is in ruins while every one of you runs to his own house. God says, I blew on it because you had wrong priorities. Sometimes people ask God to bless their life. Sometimes even believers ask God to bless them, and they wonder why he's not blessing them. They say, I'm going to church. I'm trying to do the right thing. But it still seems like my life was a bag with a hole in it. Why? Have you ever stopped to think that maybe you're investing your life in things that God can't bless? Sometimes I hear of people that divest themselves of certain stocks because of social concerns, or maybe they disapprove of things that are sinful, and that, that would be wise, perhaps. Maybe there's things in your life that you ought to consider divesting yourself of. There's some things controlling your time, controlling your thought life. Maybe it's an attitude of bitterness that you've allowed into your heart. Maybe it's an unforgiving spirit that's created this distance between you and God, and you're asking God to bless Things in your life that he cannot and will not bless. That's the message of Haggai. 
Haggai chapter 1, verse 13. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. When he said that, the Lord stirred up Zerubbabel and others, and they got busy, and they built the temple. It's a wonderful message that he gave. I am with you. Interesting thing, he's not talking about talking to one of the great patriarchs. This is not Abraham or Isaac. He's talking to garden variety people like you and I. And he's saying, listen, you are not alone. I'm with you. We don't come to God by being better, trying harder, keeping the commandments. We place our faith in God, what he has done in sending his son, and God's reaction is, I am with you. The book of Haggai is an alarm clock, and it's ringing. Its message is, now is the time. Now is the time to give your life to Christ. Not sometime in the future, but now, today. Now is the time for a believer to stop whatever spiritual drift has occurred in your life, to come back to him. And then God gives us this beautiful promise. I am with you. 